Michael Kamen is a musician who breaks down many musical barriers. He's written ballet scores, played in rock and roll bands with people such as Dave Bowie and Dave Gilmour. He has made orchestral arrangements for the Eurythmics, Pink Floyd and George Harrison. And his music has become the emotional backbone of many great films such as Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, James Bond, The New Robin Hood, Mona Lisa and of course Terry Gilliam's Brazil. When he finally decided to write some music of his own, he was able to distill and draw from these influences in his life to create a unique voice of his own. There was always a piano, and I was always banging on it, and always sitting in the middle of total chaos. There was always a world going on around me, and I was sitting right in the middle of the living room, completely and happily buried inside the piano. And I, I wanted to be a composer. And when I was really little, as, as soon as I could form the thought, I, I was thinking, yeah, that's a good job. My older brother also took piano lessons. And he had Liszt and Mozart and Bach and Brahms and all those guys in their little plastic bus. And I used to look at them and think, oh, that's very jolly, isn't it? I'll be a composer when I grow up. You know, I never studied composition, I never studied arranging, I, I, I barely studied piano, I studied oboe. Uh, one of the special things I didn't study was conducting. And so it was, uh, to my horror, the first time I did an, a, a film score, I just put the last notes on paper and then sort of looked at the orchestra taking shape in the studio and said, oh my God, I got to conduct. And you know, I, I realized it was up to me. Uh, up till very recently, the only time I'd ever conducted was in a studio. I'll start with Brazil. One, two, three, two. Michael came and the first I heard of him was he was doing the film Brazil for Terry Gilliam and we had a dinner party which Terry Gilliam was invited to and he brought Michael along. So that's how I met him and uh, right from that moment I thought, what a charmer. Brazil is, I think, my favorite film um, that I've worked on. It's one of my favorite films that I've seen too, which has always been nice. But uh, the music is a very integral part of the film. I, I, don't, I don't think I leap out from, from behind the screen. I'm, I'm supporting the action and supporting the emotions. Sometimes the music is deliberately in your face because it, you're making a, a, a point about the music, but um, the music is part of the fabric of, of the film. After that, I did Mona Lisa for George's film company. And um, I remember Pete Townsend coming up to me at a party some night and said, you better watch it, you know, you're only doing uh, all these Mona Lisa's and Brazil's and you know pretty soon they just come to you just to do other people's music just to adapt other people's music for films it wasn't completely wrong but <laughs> said, please don't leave me he said I'll, I'll buy you a diamond necklace he said I don't want one he said I'll buy you a spiller in the south of France she says I don't want one he said well, what do you want he says I want a divorce he says I wasn't thinking of spending that kind of money <laughs> we employed him actually handmade films employed him he did the film called Mona Lisa Bob Hoskins Michael Caine and Robbie Coltrane film. And uh, then after that, I did uh, the music with Michael to this film called Shanghai Surprise, you know, the famous Sean Penn and Madonna movie, which was really fun because um, for me, I've never done film scores. Well, I've done one score before back in the 60s, but in that business, you know, you're always working behind the edit. You know, you can't start until they've got the edit. And by that time, they've spent all the money anyway, so there's no money to pay the musicians. So, you know, Michael is particularly good at uh, getting a soundtrack together quickly.
The nice thing about him is that he's a trained classical musician and uh, he's not a musical snob. You know, usually a lot of classical people tend to, uh, you know, feel a bit above everybody else. I mean, they forget the most classical music was actually pop tunes written back in the 16th century or something. But, you know, that's the nice thing about Michael. His, his musical tastes will go right across the board, you know, through all kinds of ethnic music, rock and roll. I mean, he's been in rock and roll bands. He did a film score once to a, a little sort of cult movie called Polyester, which not too many people know about. Polyester. You know John Waters, who made Pink Flamingos, all those divine movies. He made a movie called Polyester in Smellorama, or smell of vision I can't... Odorama, that's what it was. Everybody had a card, a scratch-and-sniff card, when you went into the cinema, and there was a doctor up in the corner of the screen who would point to a number, and a bell would go off, I think a little piece of theme music that I wrote. And, and you'd, you'd scratch and sniff this card, and you'd see somebody pulling some roses in your face, and you'd sniff the card, and it didn't smell at all like roses, and then she'd stick some old sneakers in your face. <laughs> and that was the smell you was felt. Once I'd started writing a lot of movie scores, I realized I needed to write a piece of music of my own, um, because it's very simple when you're writing uh, the score for Lethal Weapon, or the score for uh, Baron Munchausen, or the score for Brazil, to have your brain taken from there to there, from the 17th century to you know, whatever collaborations you get into. It's important to remember your own voice, what it is you had to say. After a while, I, I found that I, I wasn't writing songs anymore. I was writing pieces. And I couldn't come up with words, although I could sing the tunes. Um, I'm not really a piano player. I can play at the piano, but I'm really not a pianist. Uh, I'd become one of those little plaster busts that used to sit on my piano. I'd become a composer. And I needed a voice to play my music. I needed a structured sound to focus for the stuff I was doing. And so the focus for these pieces is David Sanborn. One of the first things I thought of when I listened to these pieces, I, I looked at them and said, well, what are they? and I realized they were my family. So one by one, I figured out which tune was which person. Sasha is my firstborn daughter and eternally the love of my life. Um, she's got her head in the clouds, has always had her head in the clouds, and I hope she always keeps her head in the clouds. Uh, the song was just very airy, I thought. hearts to make them feel good about living and uh, the music that I write for myself and for everybody else to listen to if they care to is about life it's a, it's a, a song to humanity lead instruments of rock and roll are the guitar and the saxophone, both of which, if you just play them on their own, are absolute horrific instruments. The electric guitar without a style attached to it is awful. You need, you, you need the players, you need the instrumentalist to give a voice to that instrument. And what's so great about people like David Gilmour and David Sanborn is that their personality comes out in the instrument. So you're not just listening to the electric guitar. These guys express the force and the strength of their personality. And that face was my second solo album when Michael did some work on that. We did a track which I wrote, I think, on a Tuesday afternoon, and we'd booked the orchestral session for the Thursday. And I just plonked it down on a piano and, and sent the cassette over to him. And on the Thursday morning, we were recording that same piece with a large orchestra. 
just two days later, and it was, um, for me, fantastic to hear what he had done, totally in sympathy what, with what I had already written, and uh, just like it had only been conceived of sort of less than 48 hours before, in my mind. People have used strings on um, popular music, you know, when you think of things like Sonata and that, but when it comes down to, like, rock, pop, or whatever, like Beatles, I suppose we were the first people to use um, certain orchestrations and cellos and horns and things like that. Uh, but for Michael, I think, um, although he's classically trained and he gets most of his time is taken up doing film scores and things that are more, like, classically oriented, he basically is a rock and roll person too, and that's why this is interesting, the, the things he's writing now, like this David Sanborn piece and the piece with Eric Clapton. You know, it's good. I think music shouldn't just be in little pigeonholes. I think you can do anything you like. If you can think of it, you can do it. There used to be, many years ago, it's not so much now, sort of inbuilt, sort of almost bigotry, dare I say, you know, of, oh, you know, rock and roll musicians or jazz musicians even, you know. These barriers are all breaking down. Even within music, they're breaking down, you know. I mean, uh, George Harrison's done and, and continues to do so much for, you know, the, the, the breaking down of Indian mu music to, 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 to Western ears. Uh, Yehudi Menuhin, uh, from the classical you know, to, to Indian music. Um, and now we've got, again, as, as I said before, we've got, we've got people like Michael Kamen coming in and, and uh, confronting classical musicians uh, by the throat, you know, with rock and roll and, whoa, you know, it, and it works. There's a lot of people out there who are writing music um, who don't open their eyes to the fact that they can write any bloody thing they want. They don't have to write film music. They don't have to write 30-second jingles for soap. You know, you don't have to do that. The fact is that, that studio musicians don't have to sit there playing long, dull notes for somebody's TV commercial. They can make their own music. You know, it's our responsibility to make our own music. Zoe's my second daughter. She's now 10. And um, when David was playing the song, he was being very aggressive because that's his style. And I said, come on, man, it's Zoe. This is for Zoe. And of course, he'd been living in the house for a month or so while we were working on the record. And he's heard me always shouting upstairs. We've got five stories here going, Zoe, oh, Zoe. And that's the first phrase he plays on Zoe. He goes, oh, Zoe, oh, Zoe, with the saxophone. This is Zoe, and this is Zoe. And Sanborn goes, oh, Zoe, oh, Zoe, oh, Zoe. I spent many, many years picking out tunes on the piano um, and trying to combine them in various forms. And I'd get a bit and I'd say, oh, I know what that's for. You know, oh, that's a good bit. Um, and I'd kind of file it away quietly while I went on writing movie scores or arrangements for somebody. And uh, eventually it was time to set it all down. And uh, luckily, most of the ideas came back. And sure, I react to the world around me. And that's what partially my music is. But it's never conscious. I never, you know, go out looking for pathetic situations so I can write pathetic music. Sometimes happy things happen, you write really sad music. And sometimes really tragic things happen, and you, you find a kind of peace inside yourself, and you write some, something very beautiful. I've always wanted to make a piece for a great instrumental soloist and possibly the best instrumental soloist I know is Dave Sanborn.
Wednesday. It was Wednesday. So I was actually on the road with Stevie Wonder in 1972, and we opened for the Rolling Stones. And uh, Sanborn burst into a, a studio that I was making an album in. After a, one particularly bacchanal evening, he literally burst into the studio, mm. screaming at the top of his lungs in the middle of a take. Just kind of rolling in on the floor. And apparently that made a big impression on Michael. He decided at that moment that I was the right person to play on that record. And we played together as often as we could ever since. <laughs> Dave Sanborn is one of the great improvisers. He has an amazing technique, an amazing command of his instrument. Um, he's of the school of musicians who um, see no reason why they can't just know everything about music. They, he, he studied the mechanics of reading and writing music. He knows about chord relationships. He knows more about the structure and theory of music than I do, in fact. I was absent the day they were teaching that at Juilliard. Um, he taught me about some chord relationships, taught me how people thought about music in ways other than I was thinking. saxophone concertos written that I'm aware of, a French composer named Jacques Hibert and a Russian composer named Glazunov. Um, I have attempted to, uh, to put the instrument in context of an orchestra. Uh, it's usually not done. The sax is the bastard child of the orchestra, and they never use it. Right? I mean, that bar could take a year. Can we get one of those guys in the, in the little covered box holding up cards to go three, four, like that? That's me. Oh, that's you? <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, I've been working with the rhythm a, section too long. That's he tells some of the funniest jokes and the funniest stories in the world, among them, one time I said, I'm conducting. And he said, you're conducting. You couldn't conduct if they wrapped copper wire around you and hung you from a kite. Uh, he's full of lovely lines like that. Play your bar. Play your intro bar to that, and then I'll conduct it. I'll make believe I'm standing in relationship to you, because this is how I'll, I'll oh, be, yeah. roughly. I'll be here. You'll be there. Oh, yeah? You mean I'm not going to be back? You'll can be... I stand back where I can see you? Yeah. Can I mean, head and face this on? Is, this is about it. I mean, because yeah. I need to be... I need to be on this level with the strings, so you'll be oh, a little bit. Of you'll be all even with me. You'll be seeing me out of your. Well, can we get a, like like a, a peripheral assistant conductor to like or a mirror? Or something? Orchestra players tend to regard jazz players as, you know, hooligans, some kind of uh, other breed of, of creature. It, it takes a it takes a certain kind of discipline to play with a with an orchestra. I mean, you you think different. You know, the, you think about the rhythm differently. You think about uh, intonation and timbre of the instrument. Somebody said that conducting an orchestra is like trying to row the Queen Mary through a sea of Mars bars. For me, it was very much like that playing with it. Now, it wasn't that they were, you know, there was anything wrong with the way they were playing. It's just that the, for me, it was completely different than playing with the rhythm section, which is kind of right on top of you. The sax is an instrument that doesn't have a written literature. People give tunes to the sax player and say, hey man, blow on this. You know, instead of, hey, Paul, we should play this piece. And um, Dave's facility 
of being able to listen to a piece of music and place himself in it and above it has always been uncanny. To put him in front of an orchestra was tantamount to saying, now listen to this. And that's what the guys did. That's the orchestra was like, oh my God, he plays, doesn't he? There's nothing in the world that compares with being able to stand up in front of a big orchestra and wave your hands about until the music stops and then turn around and bow.